It's my great pleasure to welcome you here to the 20th anniversary of the European Society for Translation Studies, 20 years after the Foundation Conference, which I remember happening right here in this very room. And uh, believe it or not, I was 20 years younger then. <laughs> and many of us can remember where we were sitting. I was right at the back there, ready for a quick getaway to the airport. And I remember Hans Vermeer's plenary in this very space. Very, very hard act to follow and a very hard tradition to pretend to continue. I'd like to thank Professor Schippel, especially for the reception we had yesterday evening, for the wonderful food and too much wine that was circulated. And I'd like to, before he leaves, Michael Boyden, who is the organizer of this event, deserves our very special thanks. Michael, before you leave. Good. Center and peripheries. It's a problem. Europe versus the rest. Europe and the rest. It's a gross simplification, of course. It's not a periphery that it, in the United States, for example. The Pacific Rim is not exactly a periphery anymore with respect to Europe. But I think the, the naming of the European Society for Translation Studies is and after 20 years, it's worth reflecting on precisely that problematic. Now, I recall at the time of the foundation, there was a discussion, should we be European or not? And it's been reported to me, although I haven't found it written, that we should be international, quite simply international. And in our statutes, written in German, it stated we are an international organization and the term Europe is not mentioned in the statutes beyond the name. It's also mentioned we are an international organization and the official language is English, even though the statutes are in German, the official one. Uh, there was a clarity of vision there and then a perturbation of that vision. Now, it's reported to me that the reason for using the term European, which in hindsight might have been a mistake, was there was a hope of getting subsidies for research. And that didn't happen. But in the past year, it has happened. It took 19 years, but that logic did reach fruition. Uh, the society participated as an active network of, of informants and consultants and experts in a project for the DGT, for the Director General for Translation, on the status of the translation profession in Europe, and we were paid for it. I am hoping that there will be more projects of that kind, and um, as, uh, as Nicola uh, said yesterday, that there will be more cooperation within the European networks of the profession and of the training institutions. That was indeed in the Constitution at the very beginning. So I'm here to suggest to you, a little to play the devil's advocate, I guess, that it was not entirely a mistake to set up a society that calls itself European, and certainly not a mistake to actually be extra-European or wider than European in our operations. We have numerous members from non-European countries. We've never sought uh, to exclude anybody else. But we have now started to do things within the European context with the European institutions. Not entirely thanks to us. It's the institutions themselves that have come to see translation as more than a technocratic problem to be resolved, as more than a problem of communication within the European institutions. The DGT itself has seen that translation is a social activity uh, involving a profession and a wider use of non-professionals, para-professionals who are engaged in mediating 
between numerous different languages. I want to play the devil's advocate. Before the other speakers all suggest that Europe is bad and has been imperialistic, which it certainly has, and that what we do in Europe cannot be transported to the rest of the world, and that's certainly correct, I want to try to list a few of the good reasons for working on translation studies in Europe. Bear in mind, ladies and gentlemen, I am an immigrant. Not an economic immigrant. I'm Australian by birth. I'm non-European. I came here, not out of financial necessity, but I think, can you have an intellectual immigrant <laughs> in search of intellectual life uh, and the ideas and the implication with society that I didn't have, at least in my <clears throat> um, undergraduate training, training or my early years as a scholar in, in my own country. So I speak as this kind of convert to the cause. Converts tend to be overly enthusiastic. <laughs> be prepared. Reasons for studying translation and interpreting and localization and multimedia and all the rest in Europe. One, we do have state investment or intergovernmental investment in a multicultural model of society. Very few countries in Europe are officially monolingual and the European Union is officially very multilingual and is prepared to invest significant economic resources in that, in that policy. As opposed to several alternatives, notably the United States and the Republic of China, People's Republic of China. Number two. Europe, thanks to its history, which is not always a pleasant history, has developed a workable model of territorial democracy. The nation state, as a democratic unit, is a European invention. This is disastrous when you try to implant it on other parts of the world, which haven't had the same history is not a great model to send out, but I think there is a Habermasian argument to be restated that the idea of having everybody in a territory participate and become involved in democratic activities is our best bet for preserving human rights in the world. It's not a perfect model, it's a highly imperfect model in an age of immigrations and electronic technologies. But it's still the best bet we have for democratic participation. It's still worth working with nation states, even though they have become something else, multicultural, multilingual nation states. Three. Europe, say what you might about it, about how things work badly. Europe scores consistently very high on the corruption indexes. Do you know these things that go around the world and map the degree of non-transparency and suspicious mediation corruption? Uh, Europe, thanks to its wealth, and its high level of education and its capacity to pay intermediaries, Europe has high rankings with respect to public transparency. That's incredibly important if you've tried to work in academic institutions or governmental institutions in other environments. Here I note that the United States and Canada also score very highly, extremely highly, on those same indexes. Four, Europe has developed the world's best model of a workable welfare state. That is, inclusiveness is not just a question of rights, it's a question of economic distribution. Some countries do it better than others, but it's still something that has been made to work in Europe and in Canada, and in Australia, and other countries, South Africa is... Uh, anyway, that's... Uh, 
It's something that was developed here and can be uh, moved out. It means that when we work on translation and we work on the provision of language services and we work with governments and within governmental institutions in Europe, we are not doing so exclusively for profit. It is not an exclusively market-driven activity. In Europe, it is still legitimate to talk about human rights and the need for language services as part of the general welfare state. Do we do it well? Not at all. But do we recognize the principle that it's more than a market? Absolutely. And that is a very good reason for working with and within our European institutions. Fifth point, Europe is relatively rich still, despite all the economic crises you can imagine. And that is very important because it enables us to invest in technology and invest in technologies that will make our mediation, our linguistic mediation, in the long run significantly cheaper, therefore more elegant and more transportable as solutions. But to have that initial connection between language services in the wider sense and the electronic technologies that we have available, you need investment, and Europe has and is showing that it can make that investment. So can companies in the United States and in Canada. But we've been doing it for quite some time and doing it in conjunction with those other factors, which means we can do it with ethical social views rather than purely financial gain. Those are five good reasons for working with Europe and for not excluding any other part of the world, but just saying, this is where I work. This is where I want to develop the solutions. And if others can make the most of them, if they can benefit from them, so be it. Now, as I thought about those relative virtues, it occurred to me that there's a lot to be done on each of them. And I now want to go through those same five points and just suggest how far we are from any ideal and how much work there may be to do. This is where I'm looking towards the future of the translation profession, of translation studies, and of this society within a European context. Number one, I talked about a multicultural model. Number one, the European model, such as we have it, even embodied in the DGT, is based on the big languages of the big participants in a big war or two, which still haunts Europe. And our problems and our needs are no longer there. The models that we structured on English, French, German, Spanish, if they complain enough, we have had a history of language policy uh, within our society. Uh, and it was there. English is there in our conferences, French and German at the beginning. Spanish came on board in, in the conference in Granada. And we sort of stayed there as has much of the thinking about translation in Europe. But when you look at the real social needs that are around us, if you take seriously what I was saying about the welfare state and about inclusion and democracy, the languages that we are used in, in Europe and for which translation and interpreting services are necessary go far, far wider. I can use a bit of Catalan, but that's a little bit symbolic. You know, people in Catalonia do speak Spanish, even though this week we're not speaking it. There's an independence movement this week in, in Catalonia. All the so-called and badly named immigrant languages, the people who are coming in who need help and services in their languages and between their languages and the main colonial languages that we've developed, that's the most pressing need in Europe at the moment, and our traditional models are badly equipped to handle it. Our traditional models of how we think about languages and the relations between them. We have to assume, I think, an enormous asymmetry between the sides engaged in the encounters we work with. 
That is new, it's a challenge, and it's an intellectual challenge that this society will have to face. Two, I talked about territorial democracy. We live in a world of great mobility, mobility at the high ends of our profession, because most markets are extranational, international, multinational, and at the lower ends, because of economic necessities, we have huge waves of migration. We have to recognize that the territorial unit itself is in danger and that the provision of services has to be able to address the mobility above and below, at the top end and the bottom end. This is very practical things. Um, the study we just did, uh, one of the things we looked at was um, st state authorized or sworn translators and or interpreters, since they're usually working together in the legislation. We're still in a world in Europe where the legislation is national at best, regional in many cases, and local in other cases. It can depend on the court in the town where you need, need your language services. And yet, by its very nature, the provision of legal services requiring linguistic mediation is transnational. People move, translations move, translators move. And the reasons for not having some European level certification or standardization is mysterious. We have to accept the benefits of the nation state, but recognize that for many of our professional reasons, we have to move beyond that and develop wider institutional models. And I think that's an area in which the DGT can help us significantly and some elegant thought from among scholars can help solve those very real problems, historical problems, on the ground. There's a, an, another annotation to that. Because our democracies become transnational in that way, because we have to develop European institutions using translation, and interpreting, what happens? The very language that we use, not the languages, the language, the discourse, the way we speak, becomes the transmission of information, legally necessary information. We get that, we do that, we translate a an enormous amount of material. You count the pages and it is counted and quantified and we say, well done, we have translated all that. But what you lose if you see translation in terms of information and only information is any sense of inspiring people, moving them, motivating them. Now, it's not an accident. Uh, an accident. I've... I've uh, been in the United States and happened to witness two political parties have their national conventions. And there is the convention in the convention of the 20 minute speech that puts it all together, says where we are and says where we're going. And everybody in a nation of 330 million can understand more or less, more or less. Europe doesn't have that culture. And it's one of the consequences of being multilingual. It's very difficult to be inspired by a European ideal from within Europe because the texts are anodyne. They give information. You have the rights, you have the laws, but you don't get the aspiration. To understand how good Europe is, you have to be outside it and want to come to it, it, into it, I think. Within Europe, the communication regime is not designed to motivate people. That is an intellectual problem and a communication problem and a translation problem. If we continue to see translation and interpreting as the provision of information according to legal necessities, we are going to lose the very reasons for which people will participate, become involved, 
in our democracies with enthusiasm. What we need, I think Ubaldo Stecconi said it some years ago, what we need in our institutional levels is not a translation policy, it's a communication policy. And I think we might look towards various degrees of common languages as one way of addressing that problem. Number three, I talked about our low levels of corruption and our high levels of vigilance. The downside is a very heavy bureaucracy that public policy and its implementation can become incredibly complex and often unnecessarily so. One example, I was talking with um, Harold Summers, a man who's spent most of his career working on machine translation and Harold, in recent years, has been developing uh, simple push-button machines for uh, doctor-patient interviews uh, in Britain, particularly with asthma sufferers, sufferers from Somalia. Okay, doctor doesn't speak language, uh, immigrant doesn't speak uh, English. They can communicate through the machine, very simple machine, very uh, poor technology, as the Italians used to say. Uh, and very successful. Everybody's happy with it. And then he said, well, actually, to get it used by the public health service in Britain would take about 10 years because it would have to go through all these levels, all this testing, etc. And it, it just sort of, you know, I spent years developing this nice little machine. It's going to take so long uh, to be actually implemented. It's a problem. And we have to work with that and try to overcome that. Number four, I talked about a workable welfare state. The problems here are fairly obvious, I think. Our thinking about translation and cross-cultural communication is not well adjusted to the needs of immigrant communities. An example of this is resistance within our profession to the use of paraprofessionals, of people who do not have fully professional training, but who do have the languages of the communities we have to help. You can learn a lot by looking at countries that have worked on this problem for longer. Australia, Canada, Sweden is a good example as well. Europe, in our thinking about protecting the translation profession and developing it, hasn't realized successfully, I think, that we have to work with people who are not full professionals, who will not get full training, who even do not have full literacy, but have the command and the trust of the many languages that we have to see used within Europe. Number five, we are a rich world. Yes. And I mentioned that as being useful because of the possible connection with technology. But no, we still have massive resistance to what can be done with technology, especially free online machine translation, which serves or opens the possibility of everyone being able to translate for themselves a bit. The predominant view in most of our training institutions is that this is bad, and understandably so, because we train professionals, the professionals are going to be challenged by a society in which everybody can translate a bit, but not necessarily so. And I think we have to use our wealth and the, and, and the extensive training programs that we have to think creatively about what's going to happen down the road and how we can interact with those technologies. The simple point to make is this. If you have free online translation that is usable to some extent, there will be more translating. There will be more awareness and engagement with linguistic diversity. And because that pie gets bigger, that social activity, that multilingual engagement gets bigger, there is more work for professional translators. 
often as revisers, as post editors, as the people who can come in and check and fix up the bad translations, if you will, or can simply give the stamp of approval that has social trust. That is a huge challenge for our training programs and our very thinking about what the translation and interpreting profession is. At the moment, though, I tend to find resistance with respect to what technology can offer, and I would hope that down the road our scholars and our research can show how that bright future, that extensive future, that promise of a society which everybody can translate all the time, how that can fit into our ideals, the ideals of the European Society for Translation Studies, which were to create knowledge about translation. Thank you very much.